Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, look forward to having a topic tonight about ultrasound guided procedures for the shoulder area uh, to help out patients with chronic muscle skeletal pain in that region. Um, um, I, I currently have an academic appointment at the University of Nevada, Reno, and part of that is training the primary care physicians how to do uh, peripheral nerve and peripheral joint injections. And part of doing that and making sure it's safe is utilizing ultrasound and the right equipment, especially needles, to make sure that you can see where you're at to get the structure you're looking for and prevent the patient from having any uh, complications or, or safety issues. Tonight, I'm lucky to have my friend and colleague, Dr. David Rosenblum from uh, New York. He will be joining us tonight to share his expertise on um, uh, this topic as well and, and to help me out. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I'm a physical medicine rehabilitation doctor um, who did a pain fellowship on board certified in both. Um, I initially moved to Reno, Nevada in 2007, started my own clinic in 2009. Um, besides being in private practice, I've got an academic affiliation, or, or sorry, not an academic, but a, a co-management uh, uh, affiliation with one of the local hospitals. And uh, through that affiliation, we applied for our gold medal and received it in excellence in lower back pain in 2013. And I believe uh, a decade later, we're still the only facility that has that distinction. And last year, I was lucky enough to be nominated to be uh, the 2021 Innovator of the Year uh, by the uh, Northern Nevada Business Magazine. So uh, thanks for having me tonight. Um, our, my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Rosenblum, is like I said earlier, is in New York. He works at Monami's uh, Medical Center. He's well known uh, for his pain exam podcast and, and helping train people to pass the pain exam boards. Um, not only is he an excellent uh, pain physician and training young physicians, but he's well versed in ultrasound and an expert in the area. And he, he currently does a lot of national training um, uh, for uh, physicians already in practice or even fellows um, as they want to learn this, this skill moving forward. <clears throat> Our contact information uh, um, is right here. Um, you can either get a hold of me through my website or my email. Same with Dr. Rosenblum. Um, very receptive. We want to make this a, a, a conversation and get everybody's questions answered. So if you don't get an answer from us tonight, feel free to reach out to either one of us individually after tonight's program. Um, and, and I'm gonna invite Dr. Uh, Rosenblum to join us now. And I'm gonna turn it over to him to talk to us about ultrasound basics, and then we'll get into more specific injections and techniques for the shoulder. Thanks, Dennis. And I wanted to thank Payunk as well as Azra for helping us on the webinar. And um, let's get started. So we're gonna talk some ultrasound tonight. If we can move to the first slide. Um, we're going to start with the basics. I know a lot of you may have some experience with ultrasound, but there are a lot of people who haven't. So if you can advance, the uh, high frequency sound generated specific frequency ranges are sent through tissues and frequency is defined as cycles per second. The waves are usually over 20,000 cycles per second or 20 kilohertz, and they're not audible as you can imagine. Um, the human ear actually has sensitivity in the range of 20 to 20,000. So when we're using ultrasound, we're going above that and therefore you can't hear it. The sounds are being bounced back to the transducer where there are crystals and the way the sound comes back, whether it's absorbed in the tissue, reflected or allowed to pass through, depending on the density of that tissue, will determine what comes back. And then a, a, the distance is plotted and a picture is made on your screen, a two-dimensional picture of the three-dimensional structure that you're scanning. Penetration is, is largely based on the frequency produced. So lower frequencies, for instance, two megahertz will penetrate deeper than a higher frequency at 10 megahertz. Brightness is the amount of reflection or acoustic characteristics of the tissue. For instance, bone will be brighter than water, which is darker. So as I mentioned, you have these piezoelectric crystals that listen for reflections of the sound and the time between sending and receiving equals distance. The amount of energy reflected, not absorbed or propagated equals the density and 
substances containing lots of water are very good conductors of sound and reflect very little appearing dark. They're echolucent. Substances that contain little water, such as bone or air, will reflect the energy and appear very bright. So you have different settings on the machine and different tricks you could use. There are some machines that actually have something called B steer, which is when the crystals are aligned in different directions. It helps you see around corners. It could be very useful. Um, enhanced with compound imaging, multiple lines of crystals of, on the transducer will emit and receive the sound in multiple planes. And then it will come up with that final image that you see. Color Doppler is of course use, useful, especially for those of you who are doing nerve blocks. Many blood vessels or many nerves can actually appear like blood vessels. They're black in the center or, or they're uh, echo lucent. And therefore it's important to use Doppler to make sure that the structure you're looking at or targeting is not a blood vessel. At other times, it may be useful to find the blood vessels when you're looking for the nerve that runs with them. For instance, a genicular nerve block. The genicular nerve is quite small. So finding the blood vessel with Doppler will help you identify the nerve, which is usually just a hyperlucent or small white speck, an echogenic speck. So there are different types of probes. You have the low frequency probes, which are used for deeper structures, such as the gallbladder, kidneys. And then you have the high frequency probes, which are typically flat. The low frequency are more round and the high frequency have a flatter head typically. And the high frequency is most useful for the superficial structures or smaller structures that are usually not deeper than three to four centimeters. However, with the newer machines, some of the higher frequency probes are actually able to see deeper so therefore you have a lot more versatility with them. Sometimes the curved lower frequency probes actually could be useful with certain nerve blocks, for instance, the infraclavicular brachial plexus block where you might need that curve to get between the clavicle and your probe. So once again, here's a picture of a deep, uh, a, a deep scan with a low frequency probe, it's curved. And here's the high frequency probe for superficial structures. So it's important to be sterile when you're, when you're doing these procedures, of course, and the degree of sterility will often depend on what you're doing. Of course, be as sterile as possible, but when we're doing work in the spine, it may require draping, whereas a shoulder injection, many clinicians will not drape the patient. They'll clean the skin and use sterile technique, of course. It really depends on where you are and what you're doing. Positioning is also a big deal when it comes to ultrasound. So you need to make sure that you're optimizing this. And if you're doing a shot under x-ray guidance versus ultrasound guidance, it's, it's different positions. It, it, may, it may be a different position. Also, unlike when doing a fluoroscopic procedure versus a ultrasound procedure, ultrasound requires you to hold the probe while you're doing your needling. Whereas when you're using a C-arm, you may have both hands free or only one hand uh, busy, so you may be able to do other things. And this may be more relevant for when you're doing higher and or more advanced procedures, such as implanting peripheral nerve stimulators, et cetera. So in terms of the knobs, once again, every, and every ultrasound machine is quite different. And some of them have these features. Some of them, the features are actually programmed to be automatic. For instance, the gain can be an auto gain as the gain adjusts itself based on the depth. Attenuation is the emitted ultrasound wave amplitude getting smaller as it penetrates the tissue. The gain is basically how the machine overcomes this attenuation. Time gain compensation increases the amount of gain given to an input signal as its sampling time increases monotonically. This counteracts the excessive sound dampening properties of human tissue. So when we're scanning, we talk a lot about transverse, oblique views, so the transverse plane is the axial plane that's perpendicular to the long axis of the body. It separates top from bottom. Oblique is not necessarily at a right angle to the other planes mentioned. As you see here, you're, you're, you're turning the probe like a 45 degree angle, that would be considered oblique. So I'm always advocating this, I know it's hard. I like to use both hands. So if I'm doing, for instance, since we're talking about shoulder today, a bilateral suprascapular nerve block, I'm going to go onto the patient's left side and give them the shot with this hand and switch hands to go to the right side to do the shot on the other side. I find it to be much easier, it's less awkward. So especially if you're beginning, learn to do it 
with both hands, it will save you a lot of time and grief later on. And I think if you practice scanning the patient with a finger or two on the patient, you'll find you're sliding off less. When, when it comes to the shoulder, right, it's very easy to slide off the shoulder, maybe if you're scanning the subacromial space. So when you have your fingers on the patient as well, you're stabilizing the probe. And you need to have that probe stable so you can, once your needle's in, your needle is where you put it, right? So if your probe is not in the right place or moves, it could be a problem. Definitely practice with the phantom. Um, I, I think it, it's really, um, a lot of this is, you know, the anatomy, which we're going to go over a lot. Then there's also the actual hand-to-eye coordination and lining up your needle with the probe. And there are tricks to do this. And here's one of the tricks that we use. It's called the jiggle technique, where basically I'm shaking my, my needle. Yeah, you can press play. Thank you. Here's a sciatic nerve block. Sciatic nerve is at the bottom left, and the needle's coming in. And I don't see my needle so well. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm moving like this in little movements, and I'm scanning back and forth with the probe to find the tip. And you'll note that towards the end of the injection, when I start to inject over here, it, it should come into view. And you see the tip right there. Um, I don't have the pointer controlling it, but it's basically right there at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock of the, of the nerve, maybe 11 o'clock. Thank you, perfect. So in terms of needles, um, I mean, Obviously, echogenic needles are the way to go, especially for more complex patients. And when you're learning, when you're when you're starting out and you want to be able to document, you know, it's very important in this day and age that we document everything. So I use all types of needles for my shots, but the echogenic needles are definitely more helpful for getting that perfect picture of the needle next to the structure that you're trying to anesthetize or block or inject. Um, sometimes you could use smaller, sharper needles. Uh, the sharper needle has the advantage of it may possibly be less painful. However, there may be a predisposition to, um, to injuring the nerve if you're not careful. Then again, using a blunter needle actually may also injure tissue if you're using a lot of force to get through that tissue. It may also be more painful to the patient. So there is data kind of on both sides of the coin here, and there is some controversy. But at the end of the day, if a needle is echogenic, it's, it's very helpful for, for this sort of thing. Okay, so why do our blocks fail? Well, this is more of a, an anesthesia question, right? If you're an anesthesiologist, you've probably been in the situation where you do a nerve block and the surgeon goes to start and you think you had it and the patient feels pain. And there are many reasons for this. Um, if you're doing a, a nerve block, or a group of nerves, like a plexus, like a brachial plexus, for instance, there may be septa or subcompartments, fascial membranes that prevent spread around the nerve in question. Sometimes for certain nerves, for instance, the, the C5 nerve root in the, in the scalene brachial plexus, you may have the nerve buried in the anterior scalene muscle, or even you have a piriformis muscle, maybe part of the sciatic nerve is going through that muscle. So you may not actually be getting into the plane. This is especially true for tap blocks or transversus abdominis plane blocks when you're trying to get the needle between two muscle fascial layers. And sometimes you can actually be hydrodissecting local anesthetic between the muscle and its own fascial layer and missing the nerve. Other reasons, you're not focusing properly. You may not be comfortable with the settings on your machine. You may also be injecting next to a large nerve or space, and it may not be spreading to the whole sp spot. The other reason is misjudging your needle tip, which is not only a reason for block failure, but it could be very dangerous and the cause of many complications such as pneumothorax or intravascular injections. So you have the out of plane technique on the right hand side, which is, you know, if you know what you're doing, if you know the consequences of what you're doing, it's perfectly acceptable in many situations. For instance, I use it for my joint injections of the shoulder, and you'll see a video of that later on. Or the oblique approach, which is oftentimes done accidentally, or maybe you, you're intending to do it because you have no other way of getting to your target. But with the oblique approach, you need to be very careful because you may be looking at what you think is your needle tip. And maybe even seeing a line of the needle, like partially going through that needle. So you think you're seeing your full needle, but you may not. And that's how you wind up in, in visceral structures such as lung and blood vessels. So it's very important to understand where you are and what you're doing and know where that needle tip may be. Hey, Dennis, I think we're going to kick it back over to you for shoulder anatomy. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, 
<clears throat> yeah, so I, I'm going to go through some basic shoulder anatomy and basically just kind of highlight the structures that we're going to be talking about tonight that you can do for, for patients with uh, chronic pain in the shoulder area. Um, so let, let's start out with the, the joints in this area. So you've got two main joints. <clears throat> the first one would be uh, the cranioclavicular joint, and the second one would be uh, the glenohumeral joint. So if you look on the screen here, your acromioclavicular joint is what attaches your uh, acromion to, or your, or the, the acromion part of your scapula to the clavicle. That is just anterior and superior uh, part of the shoulder. Uh, this joint is a synovial plane joint that reinforces the capsule of the shoulder, and its movements include protraction, retraction, elevation, and uh, depression. Now, if we look at the glenohumeral humeral joint, this is a more of a synovial ball and socket joint. It's a, a multi-directional, so it potentially can make it a lot more unstable. The strength of the joint uh, depends on the tone, uh, basically, of the rotator cuff, uh, uh, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and uh, uh, the uh, subscapularis. Um, uh, the weakest part of the joint lies just inferiorly, and that's usually, if you're gonna have a dislocation, that's where it's gonna take place. But since it's a, a you know a, a very mobile joint, it has a lot of different uh, motions: flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, lateral rotation, medial rotation, and, and circumduction. The next structure that we're going to talk about is the, the long head of the biceps. So this uh, attaches or originates from the scapula. It goes down through the uh, the bicipital groove. And eventually, if you track it down, it'll, it'll attach to the radius at the, at the elbow. It, it's actually a pretty useless structure. Um, really, it doesn't have anything functionally important to do. You can actually uh, deal without it. It's prone to rupturing. Um, and it can be a very common uh, a source of pain. And that's why we, we highlight uh, an injection for, for blocking um, um, that structure in order to give patients uh, pain relief. Now, uh, the next structure is the, the subacromial bursa. So this is a potential space, uh, essentially, uh, between uh, the acromion and the rotator cuff as it passes underneath the acromion. Um, typically, it, it, uh, when you have pathology, and you'll see in a couple slides later on, um, under ultrasound, you can actually see the fluid. So you'll see the, the, the tissue between the, the, the muscle and the acromion. It'll, it'll actually spread out and you can see fluid within that space. It's, it, it, your angle to come in to get to it is going to be usually from a lateral approach and you're trying to sneak your needle right underneath the, the, the tip of the acromion to, to enter that muscle um, plane. Um, Typically what happens here is it's patients who develop degenerative changes over time. They get down sloping of their acromion that causes irritation along the rotator cuff. And that's what, what leads to the inflammation and the, and the fluid in the, in the space. And then the last structure that we're gonna highlight is uh, the suprascapular nerve. So this uh, um, uh, arises uh, from the spinal cord in, in, in the patient's neck, of course, it goes down into the groove in the scapula, and it provides all the innervation to the, the shoulder joint. And so it's a common target for patients who have, especially pro, uh, chronic postoperative pain of the shoulder area uh, to block that joint, or, or sorry, not block that nerve to potentially help with neuropathic pain of, of the joint. Now, um, we're gonna transition and start talking about how to do these common shoulder injections and the ultrasound approaches associated with it. And uh, like I was telling you through the anatomy section, we're gonna highlight the suprascapular nerve, doing an AC joint injection, a subacromial bursa injection, a biceps tendon injection, and then an injection into the glenohumeral humeral joint. And as with all things that we do, um, our selection for what procedure is gonna be, be done is driven by the diagnosis. And, you know, I always say that the mystery is in the history. By doing a good history on a patient, I should have a very good idea of what's causing their pain. I should follow that up then with a thorough examination of that area and do specific 
provocative maneuvers to try to reproduce the patient's pain to confirm what I'm thinking based off of their history. And then the last thing is, is which is usually just the icing on the cake, is follow that up with some type of imaging uh, study to confirm what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing in history, and what I'm seeing on physical examination. Other times, electrodiagnostic. You know, as a physical medicine rehabilitation doctor, I see electrodiagnostic testing can be very helpful for patients who have chronic pain. It can actually uh, identify what nerve is damaged, or even if there it, it is not any nerve damage in a, in a rule out setting. And overall, I'm going to take all these things and I'm going to make my best clinical impression and do um, uh, an injection to help the patient out. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Rosenblum to talk about um, uh, a couple of these blocks, and then I'll be back later to go over the rest. Thank you. So the suprascapular nerve block, um, this is, uh, if, if you listen to me talk on my podcast, of course, I mean, I, this is one of my go-to injections. Now you can't have a one size fit, fit all for, for these nerve blocks or procedures for shoulder pain. But if I did have to choose one, this would probably be it. And it's a great place to start because it really covers a lot of things. Um, you can advance that. The nerve is a uh, descendant of C5 and C6. It comes out, leaves the supraclavicular brachial plexus, and then dives down under supraspinatus. It innervates supraspinatus, infraspinatus, runs under the trapezius, and it innervates about 80% of the shoulder joint with no skin innervation. Advance, please. So the nerve will leave the brachial plexus where that first arrow is, and then you can press click and you'll see it pass underneath the spine of the scapula. And it's sending fibers to the joint capsule as it then goes medial to infraspinatus. So I'll see patients in the office with supraspinatus pain, region, region pain, infraspinatus region pain. And of course I could do a trigger point, but many of them also have tendinopathy or shoulder pathology. This procedure has been documented. There's plenty of evidence on this does not need steroid to give long-term relief, okay? You could give five mLs of quarter percent bupivacaine, and many of these patients will get months of relief. Of course, it depends on the patient, depends on the pathology. But I'm making these generalized statements because I am using this procedure for rotator cuff therapy, for frozen shoulder, for glenohumeral joint arthritis, for supraspinatus, tendinopathy, tendinitis, muscle spasms, infraspinatus, as well as even I've used it for cervical radiculopathy, which is sort of a crazy statement. But at the end of the day, think about it. When patients have pinched nerves in their neck, what do they do? They come in like this, they go, oh, I got a pinched nerve in my neck, even if their hand is hurting them or their arm or their neck. And many of the patients will present like that probably because of the secondary referred pain, C5, C6 is commonly affected. And when I was doing, I had a period of, of my practice where I had no access to a C-arm. So I wasn't going to do a cervical epidural on the ultrasound. So I did a suprascapular nerve block because they were presenting like this. Lo and behold, many of these patients actually did quite well, never needed an actual cervical epidural, never needed surgery, and went on to have pain-free pain, pain for, for months to years. So it's a, it's a very low-risk procedure. Um, the top muscle layer is a trapezius. Underneath here, you see the supraspinatus muscle. The scapular is the hyperlucent bone. And then the transverse scapular ligament is a hyperlucent line across the bottom left corner. And you see the nerve, it's very faint here, but trust me, it's there. To the left, which is not highlighted, is probably the blood vessel. So this is how I, I approach it. Now, I don't look at the notch of the scapula, which is a classical approach, maybe the blind approach, maybe the fluoroscopic of, of approach. And many some people are probably still doing with ultrasound, which is fine, have nothing against that. But this is a very nice approach because I'm, I'm resting my ultrasound on the spine of the scapula and I'm actually guiding my needle from medial to lateral. So I'm well behind and away from the lung. And I'm aiming at that corner where the, where the nerves and the blood vessels will pass under the ligament and the nerve will wrap, yep, exactly right there. And it's a key spot because some of that local may track backwards along the scapular spine to get the fibers innervating supraspinatus. And many of it will, and then the rest of it will just anesthetize the shoulder joint and the infraspinatus muscle. Of course, warn your patients when they leave, their arm will be weak and it could last up to 24 hours. I've seen that happen, but usually it's just a couple hours. 
Many patients will get immediate pain relief, maybe some soreness from the needle stick to advance. Here's just another image uh, of, of the region. And the nerve is actually uh, right under where that line is pointing to. It's not exactly where the line is pointing to, but it's right underneath it. There's a little hyperdensity. And you see the fibers of the supraspinatus. This is a, an image where some local has already been given. So it looks a little different here. You can advance. Okay, so there's a patient of mine. I'm doing a nerve block here. The nerve is at the bottom left in that little divot. You could see um, as uh, I'm gonna localize the skin with a 25 gauge, one and a half inch needle. And now I'm using an echogenic needle to get into the region. Of the nerve and I always warn the patient they may feel a paresthesia. Sometimes they'll actually feel some sensation down their arm, some warmth. Um, that's probably the local tracking route to the axillary brachial plexus. Okay, and then I broke through the ligament and I'm actually going to aspirate and lo and behold, I get blood. <laughs> so what I did here was I repositioned my needle. I aspirated again to ensure that there was no blood. And I injected the rest of my injectate, which was about five mLs a quarter percent per pivocaine, probably at the, based on the, the color of my syringe, five milligrams, 10 milligrams depomedrol. This is great for patients who have diabetes and you don't want to give more steroids to. So when you're thinking about giving the patient a shoulder injection, but you don't want to use steroids, this is a great way to go because it's very low risk. So here's a CPT code 6441876942. Most common code would be shoulder pain, but of course there are other codes you could use. Um, here's the inject date. Um, you could use all sorts of needles for this. Just make sure the needle reaches. I think the length is important here. You need to have at least, if it's an elderly 90 year old, that's very frail, maybe one and a half inch, but for the, for the majority of patients, you're looking at at least two inches long, maybe three inches long for a needle that can get to the spot. And bigger patients definitely go with an echogenic needle, especially if you're not comfortable finding your needle with a smaller gauge. Okay, the AC joint. Okay, this is usually a very easy diagnosis to make. Patients will often complain of pain at the joint, right? And it's palpable. You could palpate their joint. You just run your finger along the clavicle. You find where the joint goes off. Of course, there are exam physical exam findings and tests you can do, um, such as the scarf sign or you know adducting the arm over to the side that can reproduce it. Patients will often have pain with lifting overhead. Um, this will typically get injured with sprain, strain separations. Patients may fall on an outstretched arm and they'll have the tenderness or the classic pain over the, the region of the acromioclavicular joint. So I usually use a linear probe, but one of the challenging parts about this joint is you can't really go in plane if you're doing it with a large probe like this, maybe with a hockey stick probe. But um, oftentimes I'll map out the area and either go out of plane or you can go in plane by turning your ultrasound probe this way and just start just running it along the clavicle until you see a gap in the bone where there's some some soft tissue and then you can just come above it and go into the joint so here's what the joint looks like under ultrasound i mean it's a great picture the problem is your probe is just blocking the entry point Here's another picture of how you can do it. See, he's using a high frequency probe. Subacromial bursa is definitely a more common injection that I'll perform than the acromial clavicular joint. And you'll do this for subacromial bursitis and um, you know, inflammation right under the acromium. So basically here's the anatomy. You have the bursa, it's the fluid filled sac that usually is not very visible. And maybe it's a thin black line on ultrasound, but in some patients it could be thicker especially when there's a lot of inflammation. You could have impingement syndrome, which you can you could do the, the, the near test and you'll have internal rotation and flexion of the arm, the Hawkins test, um, the empty can test as well. And this is a very common problem. And they respond quite well to either a steroid injection or platelet-rich plasma injection in this re region. We can advance. Um, I believe we have a, a footage of this, but basically, yeah. So you're just imaging the lateral aspect of the shoulder. You're finding the chromium, which is the obvious bone, the hyper, 
the hyperlucent structure, which is more superficial, followed by the uh, tendon of the supraspinatus. And then the bursa is just a thin black line, which you may or may not appreciate. It's right there. So it varies based on the patient, how it's going to appear, um, sometimes more visible than others. And when the, the key thing, this is one of my patients, I'm doing the injection. The key thing to doing this injection is never inject when there's resistance. You're, you're really in a thin space above the, you can press play, you'll see the movie star. You're in a thin spot above the supraspinatus tendon usually. So you don't want to injure the tendon and inject into it, right? We inject into muscles and joints and epidural spaces, but we don't inject into nerves or tendons. So you want to be in the peritendon space. So I'm going to come in with the uh, echogenic needle and you can see it much clearer right here. And I'm just, just angling it to get into the region where I'm not having any sort of resistance to injection. Um, there's not much vasculature in this area. So aspirating blood is highly unlikely, but in the suprascapular nerve, that's definitely a consideration. Um, and I think we're going to kick it back over to Dr. Patterson. Thanks, David. So I'm going to take over here and I'm going to talk about uh, injections and glenohumeral joint. Um, so the biceps tendon, as I was stating earlier, it starts um, it, it, or originates at the scapula. It then goes over the top of the humeral head. It goes down through the intertubricular groove or the bicipital groove. It comes down and attaches at the, uh, at the radius or the radial head at the, at the elbow. Um, it, it, an injection in this area usually um, is due to tendinopathy of this tendon. As I stated earlier, it doesn't have much function. So if it eventually does tear, it's not going to limit the patient from being able to do anything. Um, unfortunately, it's just a tendon that usually with rotator cuff issues or impingement um, can become inflamed and cause uh, a patient a significant amount of pain. The, the main physical exam signs that you're looking for is a positive speed sign. So that's with the patient um, uh, supinating their arm, putting it at 90 degrees, see if I can show you here, and they have resisted uh, flexion. Um, they'll, they'll describe pain right over the anterior part of the shoulder. And then Jurgensen's is a resisted pronation um, of, of the forearm at 90 degrees at the elbow. Uh, patients will describe pain over the biceps tendon since the um, uh, biceps tendon is is one of the uh, are, are one of the primary uh, supinators uh, of of the forearm. Uh, ultrasound wise, you're going to use a a once again a linear probe since it's a pretty superficial uh, structure. Uh, for this injection, I prefer using a 27 one and a half inch gauge needle because it's really a short distance that you got to got to go. Um, I, I usually use a couple of cc's of a long acting local anesthetic like bupivacaine mixed with a, uh, a steroid. My steroid of choice is typically celestone um, since it's got particulate and in theory should stick around longer and help the patient uh, longer clinically. So here's kind of an approach um, where the, the probe is horizontal. It's right over the anterior part of the shoulder. And um, this allows for you know, either an out-of-plane or in-plane injection. And here's just another view looking from a, 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 the top down. Um, if you look at here on the ultrasound, what you'll see is you can actually see the actual groove right here. So I'm gonna highlight the groove. The tendon just sits in the groove. This is actually a pretty, a pretty shallow um, uh, groove. Um, and, and here's just kind of an animation. Uh, once again, we can see the groove right here. And, and this is just kind of scanning the area uh, to show you how to best open it up, uh, up the area where they're scanning down or up, but you just want to get that right in the middle of the screen. And then the next slide, here's an in-plane injection. You can see the needle coming from the uh, superior left corner. It's coming down inside the groove adjacent to the tendon. You can see there's, you can see there's some local here, or that's actually fluid due to the inflammation around uh, the biceps tendon. And once you get kind of get down in that groove, 
you then can uh, do your injection. Um, alternatively, instead of coming in plane, you can come out of plane. Usually that's coming directly over the mid portion of the, of the probe. If you have the structure in the middle of the ultrasound screen, and usually I'll just go down and touch in the uh, um, right below the tendon underneath uh, in, in, in the groove and inject uh, my injectate. Oh, and that's just kind of an animation showing you that, you know, scanning the, the, the tendon or even going in plane or out of plane. Um, uh, as I said, I typically use a 25 or 25 or 27 gauge inch needle. Um, you really don't need a, a three and a half inch spinal needle to do this injection unless the patient is, is, is overweight. Um, as I said, I usually use a couple uh, cc's of, of bupivacaine mixed with celestone, or alternatively, you can use depimedrol. And your, your, your codes that you'll use to bill for this procedure are going to be 20551 and uh, 76942. And here's another animation showing the, the, the injection taking place. So there's your ultrasound probe using a horizontal. We're going to come um, laterally in plane. We see the fluid around the needle. You can see the needle coming down here, going just adjacent to the, uh, uh, the tendon in, in the groove. Now, um, we're going to talk about the uh, glenohumeral humeral uh, joint injection. So once again, this is a ball and socket joint. It's very unstable due to its uh, uh, multi-directional abilities to, to move. Uh, typical patients that you're going to consider doing this injection for are patients who have primary osteoarthritis of that joint, um, a labral tear that's symptomatic, or uh, adhesive capsulitis. Um, uh, uh, patients who are, you know, have no range of motion of the joint due to some underlying uh, pathophysiology. <clears throat> Things on physical examination, you know, patients who have um, passive range of motion greater than active range of motion that usually indicates um, some type of osteoarthritis of the joint that's the source of their pain um, since it hurts when, when they move it. Uh, a positive O'Brien's test uh, typically indicates that there uh, is probably an underlying labral tear. And then last but not least, when you have decreased range of motion with active and passive range of motion that usually indicates that the patient has a frozen joint or adhesive capsulitis, um, which usually, it, it can be the primary pathology, but, uh, but typically there's usually something else that um, has led to that pain. And so you may be injecting the joint to get the range of motion before you figure out uh, what is the actual underlying pathophysiology causing the patient's symptoms. Uh, once again, I'm gonna use a, a linear probe posteriorly over the joint. Um, I prefer to use um, anywhere from a 22 gauge to a 25 gauge, three and a half inch needle. Uh, the structure is usually a little bit deeper. Um, uh, once again, the injection can be done in plane or out of plane, uh, depending on your preference. Um, I typically, once I get into the joint, inject four cc's of bupivacaine mixed with a particulate steroid. Once again, one cc of uh, celestone. And here, here's kind of a view. So. Um, your acromion or AC joint sits on top, you scan down posteriorly. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get a, a view where the, uh, the humeral head articulates with the glenoid fossa so, or with the glenoid. So here you see there's the humeral head, here's your glenoid, and there's usually this triangle. That's the kind of the safe triangle in your target where you wanna place your needle. So here's an out, out of plane injection, we should see the needle kind of drop down from the center. And what we're looking for is for that needle tip to become visible, get in that triangle. Once we know that we're in the joint, once again, we'll aspirate to make sure we're not in a blood vessel. And once we see that it's safe, go ahead and uh, do uh, the injection by injecting the injectate. So what I want to do now is, you know, I, I talk about training a lot of uh, primary care residents 
and uh, trying to use the right equipment. So not one, not only do I talk to him about technique and uh, ultrasound use and, and ways to maximize seeing the needle by you know either jiggling the needle or modifying uh, my ultrasound angle to, to see it. But what I really wanna highlight here is that sometimes the needle can make a huge difference to give you the more confidence that you're gonna get that target. So if you see here, I've got a patient laying down comfortably. Um, I am doing a, uh, a, a posterior approach to the glenohumeral joint. Um, uh, and, and actually this is showing an out of plane injection here where I'm coming just down the medial part of the probe and trying to get in. Uh, what you'll see here though is the videos on the right is me doing an in-plane injection so you can get a better idea because um, I'm trying to maximize how much of the needle you can see. So my first video here is just using a uh, 33 or sorry a, a three inch one uh, or sorry a 22 gauge three and a half inch spinal needle um, that's not echogenic. Ah! you to see here is that it's very hard to see the needle you can you know i'm jiggling the needle i'm trying to adjust the ultrasound and i'm only getting a an outline and i can see in the general area where my needle is but i'm, I'm not definitively sure alternatively if i use an echogenic needle i can get good reflection especially at a steep angle um, the ultrasound beam or waves will reflect back to the probe and actually show up a lot nicer uh, on the screen. And that, that first case I just did was using the MSK, the, the Sono MSK needle made by uh, Payung. Um, in this case, I've, I've got a patient who has um, impingement syndrome. Um, and I wanted just to show you that their needles are, are pretty standard across the board and show the same um, uh, excellent visibility when you use them. And so this one, I, I chose to use the Sonoplex 2 needle, which also um, has the abilities to be a, a nerve stimulator needle as well. So probably an excellent choice to do or choose for doing peripheral nerve blocks under ultrasound. Um, as you can see here, I've got my, my probe off the edge of the acromion. So you can see the acromion here. You see the uh, the humeral head, you can see your supraspinatus tendon. And then what you kind of see here is just that shadow of that, um, uh, that potential space or the, the, the bursa just right over. Um, you can already get a glimpse that when I do this injection, um, the needle is going to show up pretty well with my echogenic needle. So I'm going to play the first video where I'm, I'm, I'm using just a standard uh, 22, three and a half inch needle. And once again, you can see the needle come down. And you really don't see the, the needle ever. You just see the injectate going in and spreading out the subacromial space. So I, I, I'm using a jiggle technique, trying to adjust my ultrasound. And on top of that, I'm, I'm kind of slowly injecting the injectate to, to really see truly where my needle is. Or when I use an echogenic needle in, this, in the same patient, I can clearly see it come down from the, the right down inferiorly to the left and see that I can, you know, see that tip really go right underneath the inferior margin of the acromion and get into that subacromial space. So I have a lot more confidence that I'm where I need to be to do the right injection to help my patient. Um, so the next thing is, is I just want to uh, talk about these cornerstone reflectors that uh, Payunk uses. Um, on their Sonos MSK and their Sonoplex 2 echogenic needles. Uh, essentially what they're doing is they're causing uh, a three-dimensional reflection of, of the needle where it's at um, and, and to return or, or maximize how much of the ultrasound waves are returned to your, your transducer to give you the best possible image. Um, and as I was stating earlier, this, these, these uh, reflection plates can even help when you have a very steep um, angle or puncture angle of your needle. So if you see here, you probably got about a, a 10 to 15 degree angle, which should return um, a, a, lot, a lot of the ultrasound waves back to the transducer, steepen up to about 30 or 40 degrees. You can still see the needle pretty well due to these um, uh, cornerstone reflectors. And then if you even see it at a much steeper angle, where typically with a regular needle, you would not even 
be able to recognize it, you'd be using a lot of the um, a jiggling of the needle um, um, to try to find where, where you're at before you do your injection. So these proprietary cornerstone reflectors were uh, made by one of our Australian anesthesia colleagues, Dr. Uh, Chris Mitchell. As I was stating, the, the, the point of these are, are they're, they're structured to maximize the reflection of the ultrasound waves to get it back to uh, the transducer to, to give you the best possible image uh, 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 and location of where your needle tip and uh, the, in the, the shaft of the needle is at. <clears throat> Um, as I showed you in my videos earlier, it helps you clearly identify the shaft of the needle and the tip on, on, while doing these procedures. And there's been several clinical uh, studies or comparative studies that have shown that these um, uh, needles have the best ultrasound reflection uh, qualities compared to their uh, competitors on the market. So I just want to highlight some key uh, takeaways. Um, using the right equipment, especially these echogenic needles with these cornerstone reflectors can allow you to see where you're at. So the injection is safer. It allows you to do the procedure faster to give your patient more uh, comfort. And on top of that, it gives you the reliability that you know that you're injecting the target that you're trying to do. Um, it gives you a, a improved tactile feedback. And as I was saying earlier, since you, you, you can see where your needle is at all times, it provides that additional patient safety. Um, and, and, and as I said, you know, with a Sonoplex 2 needle, you can also um, not only see the needle, but you can use um, uh, stimulation to stimulate the nerve um, to make sure that you're getting paresthesias in the correct area to do the procedure. Um, uh, currently, um, these needles are available in 22 gauge to 25 gauge sizes. Uh, I, I do have to qualify that uh, the Sonos MSK comes in a 25 gauge and that won't be available though until the fall of 2022. And if you want more information on Payunk's uh, needles, I encourage you to go to their website. It's www.payunkusa.com. And with that, I'm going to open it up to, I'm going to invite David back. I'm going to open it up to uh, uh, a Q&A or a, a discussion between him and I to answer any potential questions that we have pending out there. Um, so I see that we've got one here, David. I'm just gonna read it out loud and you and I can give our uh, a, an answer. So it says, any tips for holding the needle and injecting one hand while the other hand holds the probe? Basically the tip for doing the procedure without an assistant. You know, I, I actually had a needle right on my desk prior to this, and I got rid of it earlier, but <laughs> I'll use a pen instead. Um, this is typically the way um, I, I will hold my hands when I'm kneeling. So I have my hands are touching each other, the probe. So it's one unit, and I find it to be easier. So I'll be jiggling my, my needle sometimes to just scan to find it. But this is how I, you know, some shots, of course, I'm doing this, but many shots that are a little challenging, I may do this to keep them as one unit. Yeah, I, I have to say that when I when I teach the primary care residents at the university, um, the biggest mistake I see is how they hold uh, the transducer. And, and when I see a lot of them want to hold it up top, yep. I kind of tell them it's almost kind of like um, when you learn to do your ACLS or and, and you, you want to do that CE where you, you hold the mask over the face to get the best right. oxygenation for the patient. So the C is going to hold the base of the transducer and the E is the rest of your hand that's physically on the patient. And I find that that gives me the, the ultimate best control of the transducer. Because I find sometimes that when I go to look at my image, if you're holding it up top, it, you, you have a chance to, uh, to get- right. It's yeah. going to slide off when you do this. You, you totally slide off. So it's as much square surface of your, your hand that's holding the probe on the patient and only use two fingers to hold the, the transducer. Um, it, it seems to be the best key. And then you can really concentrate uh, on, on using your opposite hand to do the injection. Um, we've got uh, another question here. It talks about the, the cost of using uh, the Sonos needles versus a, a regular needle. Um, 
and they made the comment that they see a lot of value, especially for learners when they're training to do these procedures in the clinic. Um, uh, David, you want to make a comment on? I actually don't know the cost, so <laughs> I can't comment on the exact cost. Um, the the but the the value in the echogenic needle obviously as you see it better and for documentation purposes as well as safety purposes especially if you're beginning so for training programs absolutely it's how I train yeah I, I completely agree I think um, doing the procedure right the first time is you know is worth any extra cost that you may pay for a needle um, I, I always you know I always get the question from the primary care residents. You know, and, and I'll have you comment too on this, David. Is you know, oh well, why am I using ultrasound when I can do this injection blind? And I always talk to him about, you know, well, what happens when that patient comes back and they they tell you they're no better a couple of weeks later? Yeah, you, you know, you're gonna one question. Well, I did the injection blind. Did I miss the spot? Um, and do I need to repeat the injection? Or the second question, you think, well, well, God, you know. Um, uh, do I have the wrong diagnosis? And so now you're kind of spinning your wheels or treading water with that patient. And so, you know, I'd rather spend a little extra money, know that and, and use the ultrasound to see exactly where the needle is. And then when they return in two weeks and they tell me they're no better, I have the confidence that I hit the spot and that, you know, I probably just had a bad day and made the wrong diagnosis and hit the wrong, the wrong structure at that time. Right. I, I think, um, it's a big point. Also, when it comes to, like, for instance, the knee is a good example because you don't really need ultrasound to get into the knee. However, not only will the ultrasound guide you in without bumping into the bone, hopefully, and be less painful for the patient, but it's becoming the expectations of the patient that you're going to use an ultrasound because so many people are doing it. And you also can document proof that you were in the right spot. And this is especially important when you're injecting visco supplements or regenerative medicine procedures with PRP biologics. And if it doesn't work, you can at least still tell the patient, hey, look, I was in the right spot. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, we, we've got another question that uh, I'll, I'll throw out there. It says, what's the biggest mistake new physicians make while doing single shot nerve blocks? Um, as an instructor, Dave, and in, in, in teaching people, I'm sure you see a lot of people at these labs that you're teaching ultrasound guidance. What's the biggest mistake that you normally see them make when, while learning to do these procedures? Um, wow, I, I think uh, the first thing is um, not uh, understanding the, how the ultrasound and your hands need to work together and losing sight of the needle. That's the most dangerous and common problem people have when they're starting out. I think that's, yeah, I think that takes the cake. Yeah, I, I think it's you know, learning how to hold the, uh, the transducer, as I was saying earlier. Even, you know, I have residents come back, and even though I've, you know, tried to drill in their head, you know, the CE that I call it, uh, I see that they come back and they still try to hold it, and, and they lose control of the probe. I think the second thing is, is just developing, that, you know, and it's not, not, not a, a, a problem, but it's just repetition, right? You got to get, it's kind of like a, playing a video game. You got to repetitively... Uh, get used to not looking at your hands while you're looking at the screen to do it. And the more you do and the more you practice, the better you get good at learning, learning that skill. So I think it's, it's just, you know, getting that comfortability of doing that. The other thing that I, I think a lot of people do is they, they, uh, they may over scan. Usually it's subtle movements, right? Whether it's a slight tilt of the transducer, like wagging it, or a, a, a gentle slide a couple millimeters left or right to pick up the needle. I think sometimes um, uh, new trainees try to make two, uh, uh, you know, instead of fine tuning or, or fine motions, they make gross motions with the, the transducer and they, they really get lost where they're at. Yeah, and, and one quick tip is whenever you're doing something such as like a glenar humeral joint, whether it's from the posterior or anterior approach, have like the same technique for finding it every time. For instance, the easiest thing to find is the humerus. So just find the humerus, maybe the biceps tendon, if you're going anteriorly, and then scan over to the joint or the same thing with, with the back where, where you're looking for the labrum or the lenoid. No, like get the easy, the low hanging fruit, get the easy big structure, and then use that to find the target structure, like the joint space, for instance. I, I completely agree. Always know, always, you know, when you do a certain injection, you know, find what you're comfortable with identifying quick and easily. 
and call that your home. And anytime right. you get lost, you know, rescan back to your home and then scan back to your target. Um, I think once once you get comfortable seeing that anatomy multiple times under the ultrasound and knowing what your home structure is, it's always easy to find your target after that. Absolutely. Now, um, I, I don't see any other pending questions right now. Um, we've got a few more minutes, David. I just want to throw this out to you. Um, another question I hear from residents all the time is if they do use ultrasound, can or will insurance pay for them to do the procedure under ultrasound? It's a great question. Um, the insurance companies, um, well, with just about everything, used to be easier. Uh, they bundled the ultrasound codes for the joints. So instead of billing two separate codes, you're billing one code. Still for nerves, tendons, most of them are still separate codes. And many of them will actually reimburse separately for the ultrasound code, which is 76942 for ultrasound guidance. Yeah, I, and I, I've rarely seen an issue with getting reimbursed for using ultrasound. Some insurances may require prior authorization in order to get it approved, but ultimately I've never seen it be a sticking point or an issue. Um, if it does become one, uh, then I can still do the injection blind. Um, I'm not as nervous about doing blind injections um, if um, I'm using steroid, but if I'm using a visco supplementation type product, you know, I, you, you get extra particular, you know, especially if you're trying to do it in a joint, you can cause that synovitis, potentially make the patient think that their joints infected or you cause an infection. And there's nothing like sweating that out for a two to three day, three, two to three day period of time with multiple phone calls by that patient to your office. That's right. And, and when you inject, make sure it's easy to inject. For 99% of these things, especially if you're in a joint, you could have a little resistance, but not much. You shouldn't be forcing these shots. Yeah. Um, I've got a question. So you looking at um, the Sono MSK needle, and I probably already answered this earlier, um, uh, um, but when would you pick the Sono MSK needle versus the Sono Plex uh, the two needle? Is there, is, is there a different clinical sort of yeah, I mean, I do peripheral neuromodulation. I do trials. Um, so I, I, I need a stimulating needle. Um, some anesthesiologists will use stimulating needles for their nerve blocks just to help them localize the nerve. But if you're doing ultrasound a lot, you usually don't need that. Um, but when you want to do a trial for a possible permanent implant on a peripheral nerve stimulator, which are becoming more popular and have gained traction because they work for a lot of pain problems, especially shoulder. I've, I've had a lot of success with the shoulder, suprascapular, axillary nerve. I mean, almost every axillary nerve block I do is usually a stimulating trial for a possible stim, not because I want to block the axillary nerve. So yeah, I mean, that's when I would use it. And, and, and earlier you were talking about being a, um, an advocate for doing suprascapular nerve blocks. And I have to say, I've, I've kind of gone to those uh, for shoulder pain over the years, um, especially trying to do a, um, a block to give temporary relief. And, and other times I've actually done uh, radiofrequency ablations of that nerve um, to help with chronic shoulder pain. Uh, but I just want you once again to kind of give the indications or the scenarios where clinically um, doing a suprascapular nerve block seems to benefit uh, patients with chronic pain. Okay. Um, anyone who has shoulder pain and is diabetic, frail, severe osteoporosis, you're scared to give a steroid to, you should try it. Because it's, you know, if you could get away with no steroid, you're doing the patient a favor. Um, patients who you want to do a peripheral nerve stimulator trial on, you might want to do a suprascapular nerve block first. I've had, I mean, people who've had reverse shoulder replacements, all sorts of things, you know, when you can't inject the joint. Where, you, where do you go? So the suprascapular nerve is a great go-to shot. Um, patients who have rotator cuff tears, frozen shoulder, the patient who says, oh, I got a pinched nerve. I mean, try it. It's not in the textbooks, but I'm telling you, most of them will be happy. They'll even say their hand feels better and their neck feels better, even though the nerve doesn't go there. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. Um, and then it looks like we got one more uh, question that I figure we'll answer live. And then at that point, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll probably call it a night unless anything else gets snuck in. But we've got a question here that says, since sharper needles are less painful, why would everyone use a sharper needle versus a regular needle? Do you want to handle that one? Sure. Um, well, a regular needle, when you say regular needle, if you're referring to a blunt needle, 
Um, I wouldn't say a blunt needle is a regular needle. It's a blunt needle. Um, and there are advantages to it. It's great for certain nerve blocks where you need to feel yourself go through planes of fascia. The transverse abdominis plane, the fascia iliaca, it works really well. But sometimes you need to put a lot of force on the, even with a sharp needle, if it's a small gauge, I have patients who, if, when I'm doing injections with 25 gauge needles, the needle's bending and flimsy and I can't get through the skin, making jokes about them being from Krypton and whatnot. But really, I mean, you, you need to understand the sharp needle will get there quicker and easier and less painfully in many cases. So that's why I use it. Oh, and, and actually I see in the queue or in the chat section, there's a question there. I wasn't putting the, the question and answer section, but I figure um, we'll do one more just so we can answer everybody's questions. And then from there, um, I, I will tell you where you can find a recording of this presentation um, so you can access in the, in the future. Um, but there's a question here that says, what is the value of using extension tubing um, uh, when using the echogenic needle? Is it used so you can assess or, or sort of assess for aspiration of, of blood? Um, I, I, and I, I'll, I'll answer this one. So I think it's, it's just more for having, um, getting your hands out of the way of one another. So if you have extension tubing, um, you're not worried about holding the syringe, you can hold onto the needle and have better control of it without having a, a more cumbersome, um, uh, you know, a needle attached directly to the syringe. The extension tubing just allows you to, just to be able to control the needle without having to worry about the rest. Yeah, it, 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 I, I guess in theory, it can help you see the aspiration easier. Um, uh, it, but yeah, I mean, I, I do it both ways. I'm not, uh, I usually just use the extension tubing to make it easier so my hands don't get in the way of one another. Do you have any thoughts on that, Dave? I agree with that. I mean, um, coming from the anesthesia world, almost everyone uses extension tubing, especially when you're giving large amounts of local, which in the office, I'm not giving 20 to 40 mLs. But in the OR, that's what we're doing. And I guess with the ability to aspirate and see the blood clearly and show everybody the blood. I mean, you, you just have like, usually it's more than one person in the room and I don't know, doing the procedure together. So I think it's, it's, it has the advantage of freeing up your hands. And like you said, holding the hub is a big deal. I think it gives you more needle control and help hopefully an easier block. Yeah. So um, in the chat section, if you, if you look there, there will be a replay available of tonight's presentation on uh, Payunks. Uh, USA YouTube channel. There is a link in the chat box if you want to copy and paste that before we end tonight's uh, telecast. And uh, once again, you know, I, I know everybody has a choice on where they could be on a Wednesday night in the, in the you know, early evening or late evening, depending on which uh, time zone you're on. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, David, I want to thank you for being a part of this amazing experience. And I want to thank Azra for hosting it and for uh, Payunk um, for giving the two of us the opportunity to speak about their product and, and hopefully get more awareness out there about it. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.